I have been told uh, to moderate this session on impact bonds. And uh, from what I've heard from a lot of people that I've interacted with in, in the past few days, it seemed like uh, a quite a new phenomena. It's, of course, an innovation that's come out in the last three years. Uh, the first impact bond was launched in 2010. And uh, we thought that it was relevant for us to introduce the concept of the social impact bond first and spend a few minutes talking about it and what, talking about what it is, about, it is before we uh, get into the panel discussion itself. So uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes, or in fact, uh, four or five minutes speaking about what it is and then, and then move on to the panel. Uh, the, the, the social impact bond is, of course, being talked about one of the uh, most promising innovation that, that has come in the, in the last few years. And uh, it's primarily come out of certain challenges that were faced uh, both in the development sector and on the, uh, and on the government side in funding. And I've highlighted uh, some of the causative factors that have led to the creation of the, of the first social impact bond. And uh, I, I like to highlight some of the key uh, uh, causes here. So we have seen a lot of uh, public services being delivered and public services being delivered uh, uh, by the government and various other organizations. There has been a lot of public funding in the last, uh, 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 I mean, several decades uh, going into both development and delivering public services itself. Unfortunately, uh, we have not had a system of of measuring what the outcomes are of those uh, of of the delivery, and uh, the lack of measurement and the lack of value attribution has been uh, a problem, uh, because we have actually persisted with a lot of programs, not knowing whether we have actually succeeded in delivering them or not, because uh, the government has traditionally been focused on the inputs and the outputs and not necessarily the outcomes, and. Uh, that's been an increasing pain point over the last decade or so. And it's been talked about and it's been, uh, uh, and, and various stakeholders have tried to address uh, uh, and bring about a solution to address that problem. Second, the uh, government has actually uh, delivered a lot of programs through service providers and service providers for the social services sector have been delivered very largely through the non-governmental organizations, the NGOs. And the NGOs are not typically in, uh, uh, in a position to bear the upfront cost for the, uh, for the development activity. And uh, uh, I mean, this is typically funded by the government. And, uh, and so the lack of funding has, has been an increasing constraint over the years. Then, uh, because the government is risk averse in general and is not necessarily prone to uh, be very, very supportive of, uh, of a lot of innovations, uh, especially when you know that there are compulsions, there are political compulsions, and there are uh, uh, budget cuts that are around the corner. So it's very difficult for the government to accept innovations. And hence, we have seen very limited innovations in delivery, uh, in trying out uh, various models, in trying out new models to actually achieve outcomes. And hence, most of what most of the work that NGOs have actually done has been focused a lot more on inputs and outputs and not outcomes. So uh, with, with this as background, of course, uh, I'll, I'll move over to the UK, which has uh, emerged as a hub of innovation, uh, especially for the impact bonds, uh, where we have seen the first impact bond emerge in 2010. And we were trying to analyze why UK has actually emerged as, as that hub of innovation. And we figured that there were two key reasons for that. Uh, one of which is to do with the changing political and the ideological climate itself over the last 10 to 12 years, and not necessarily uh, something that we have seen as an innovation overnight or over a period of one year. So as late as 2000, uh, there was a cabinet uh, committee report uh, on encouraging uh, involvement of private sector participants and uh, outsourcing of both funding and delivery of programs for public services. So this was a recommendation by the Social Investment Task Force way back in 2000. And over a period of time, there has been a focus on uh, coming out with mechanisms to actually figure out how delivery can be done through agents which are outsourced and funding which can be outsourced. So there has been a shift in, 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 in climate, in ideology, 
in terms of thinking around how the public services can be delivered. Second, we have seen the uh, uh, huge unprecedented cuts in, in funding happen to the government, uh, and that was post the financial, service, financial crisis in 2008. And we see that as one of the key triggers that has led to this innovation uh, to come out in the UK. And a little bit about the first bond that came out in the UK. So uh, this was announced in 2010, of course, and uh, uh, it was focused on, uh, uh, on, on basically uh, recidivism, and uh, the idea here is expressed in the slide itself. Uh, so, uh, the idea was to actually prevent people who are coming out of prisons to go back and start, uh, I mean, go back into crime. And there was an effort to uh, design an outcome based on, uh, uh, on this. And then the funding was supposed to be, so if there was a re-offense uh, of prisoners in a certain period of time, uh, that would be taken as the outcome. And depending on the percentage of the, uh, the re-offending rates, uh, the government would fund back the uh, the organization which delivered this program. And post that, there have been uh, 16 operational SIBs or social impact bonds in the country today. So just a little bit more on the social impact bond itself and what it is about and the features uh, uh, of the social impact bond. So it's basically a way to, uh, it's a pay for success contract. Uh, the government pays only for results. And if a program is funded, funded by the SIBs achieves successful outcomes, which are defined and agreed upon in advance by all the parties, it's only then that the government repays. Uh, and they repay the principal along with an interest. And that interest can vary uh, between uh, the late uh, single digit numbers to possibly even the double digit numbers, depending on the outcomes achieved. And uh, the primary features of a social impact bond are that the measurement and measurement of outcomes is actually inbuilt into the product itself. Because if you want the government to pay the service provider, it has to be based on the monitoring of a third, on, by a third party and the measurement of those outcomes. And those outcomes are translated into a financial metric where value is attributed and that value is essentially paid for by the government. So measurement evaluation is actually inbuilt into the product itself. Second, the uh, government pays back investors only if the pre-agreed performance targets are met within a specified timeline, which means that you're actually forcing more further efficiency into the system, and you're forcing government not to spend on programs which not deliver outcomes. So, uh, so in some sense, you're actually bringing in a lot of trans transparency, accountability uh, into the system, you are forcing an efficiency, and you're also uh, making sure that you are uh, monitoring the outcomes of the, of the program. Then you have brought in private investors who can actually provide the upfront capital. So this is where the greatest innovation of the, of the structure is, because uh, what's been found is capital markets have a lot of capital, private investors have a lot of capital, but there have been an, uh, a lot of constraints in funding from every other source. And there should be ways of tapping into the into the potential of capital markets and private investors for, for delivering social services. So that's largely the idea. And uh, uh, this lays down the typical structure of a social impact bond. You have the various participants or players here. Uh, the investor actually pays the upfront money for the program to be delivered to the implementing agency or the service provider. Then you have an outcomes funder, which is essentially the government, which pays for outcomes achieved by the by the service provider. And uh, uh, you have an, an intermediary which actually structures the entire and puts, puts it together and brings together all the stakeholders and issues the bond. Now, uh, one thing that you may want to keep in mind is the fact that while it is termed a social impact bond, uh, it is not a bond in its true sense because uh, you can actually lose capital. So in some sense, it's a misnomer. But, uh, uh, but that's the term that has actually got uh, popularized. So uh, there are, of course, several other case studies that, in fact, social finance is, is partly working on. And uh, I mean, you're looking at several other sectors where social impact bonds could be executed, could be implemented. And uh, 
uh, we would tend to think that there are a gamut of sectors which are largely untouched at this point in time. And there is a huge potential in actually taking it forward and implementing it across different sectors in, in multiple other countries. So the key question that we want to uh, address here is whether this concept of the impact bond, uh, which is quite revolutionary in nature, can actually make a huge impact in India. And is it, is it very relevant? Is it very appropriate uh, in this country uh, for delivery of uh, social services? Now, for this, we have a set of players who, in fact, can do pretty much a role play here because we have two service providers, essentially the implementing agencies. We have uh, Pradhan and we have Educate Girls. And uh, we have someone representing the government who can be an outcomes funder. And we, we potentially have an investor who could put in the upfront capital. So uh, with that, I'll start the discussion here, and I'll actually request each one of them to introduce the organization, the work, and uh, speak about how a social impact bond could be relevant for their, for their organization. And then we will uh, go on to have a discussion around some of the challenges and, uh, uh, and a few other uh, topics, and then move on to questions and answers from the, from the audience. We wanted to keep it very interactive, and we have actually kept a provision for, uh, for a longer time for the Q&A session itself. So with this, I'll, I'll uh, request, in fact, Anish to uh, start uh, with introducing his organization and, uh, and uh, what he feels are the constraints in funding and uh, how a social impact bond could be relevant for, for your organization. Thanks, uh, Atria. I work with an organization, uh, non-government development organization called Pradhan. This organization supports poor communities, build capacities to dream and realize uh, those dreams. Today we work with close to one and a half million people and majority of them are among the indigenous and Dalit communities. These are in the 40 of India's uh, poorest uh, districts. We build social collectives like uh, self-help groups of women and the women uh, federations. We also build economic collectives like producer companies, cooperatives. Uh, in the 5,000 odd villages that we work today, we have uh, ensured food security, around the year food security. We have built resilience in the household livelihood uh, systems. We have, uh, the women in these villages don't take uh, don't accept violence. In these villages, uh, through our efforts, we would have generated last physical, uh, incremental, cumulative uh, livelihood uh, outputs to the tune of rupees uh, 650 odd uh, crores. So that's a bit about uh, Pradhan. And why I see importance of uh, something like an impact bond in the Indian context? I was looking at you know, the huge outlay outcome uh, gaps that plague uh, the Indian uh, development landscape. The last 15 years, our development, uh, social sector development has spent increased 15 fold. So that's close to now $30 billion uh, spent. And last year, in the UNHDI, March it was uh, released, we were at 131, the same as 15 years back on the Human Development Index. And giving us company at 131 was Equatorial Guinea. So even though the outlays have increased 15-fold, in terms of outcomes, we are really uh, lagging behind. So I see a space, a huge space for a focus on engaging on outcomes. So that's at the, the national level. As an organization, I see couple of uh, spaces where I think this could be very, very critical for us. The communities that we work with uh, have a huge intergenerational um, you know, deprivation uh, because these are, uh, they have been isolated from the mainstream like the indigenous, the tribal communities or discriminated within the mainstream, excluded from the mainstream like the Dalits in any of our uh, you know, caste villages, the Dalits would not participate in socio-economic exchange. So with these families, any of our engagements uh, typically would be of seven to 10 years duration, depending on the context. So a graduation cycle of seven to 10 years is required when people are, communities are on a spiral of growth, which uh, they can 
you know, sustain on their own. Our program grants, and that's where, you know, almost 97, 98% of Pradhan's uh, funding would come from, through program grants. These are typically three to four year grants. Even if it is a partnership with government, it will still be in the range of, uh, you know, three year grants, four year grants. And with government, there is additional challenge that uh, this whole notion of uh, you need capable people to build capacities at the ground is not very well appreciated. It's still about uh, the material, the, the delivery of, uh, you know, services. So the need for uh, people with, uh, who can stimulate capacities in other human beings is not very well appreciated. So our costs from government are very minuscule if I look at the overall Pradhan budget. I see in this a space to mitigate this uh, time horizon mismatch. So if I am looking to create uh, outcomes, irreversible, durable outcomes, say in the seven year time frame, and if uh, there is upfront investment, so investments is not averaged out over the graduation life cycle. So in the initial period, there's a more investment as you build you know, collectives of communities and then you, you know, train them into a few things and then they start you know, taking things on their own. So if there was a funder which gave us upfront more money and we could uh, show from say year three onwards, there is irreversible trend towards the outcome, right? So I see a huge uh, space for, uh, you know, this kind of a bond supporting this uh, time horizon mismatch. The other space, and given the governance, uh, you know, challenges we have in India, so all the government programs would have, you know, any program you would have, you'd have many NGOs. And then the politicians itself would have their own NGOs. So there's a clutter of NGOs there. So we are a professional organization with a strong result focus. I see if something like uh, outcome linked, uh, you know, payment structure for want of a better word, I'll put it like that, if it was there, so someone like us could break through that clutter and, uh, you know, place uh, uh, ourselves in a better way and attract uh, more resources to do more and more work and reach out to more poor communities. These are two spaces I see definitely you know, opening up uh, for an organization like Pradhan. Right. So you feel that the, that the outcomes that your organization actually delivers can be measured and you can actually attribute value and it should be possible for you to raise funding based on that. Sure, sure. So and that we, we are uh, very, very uh, conscious of and we see it a challenge in uh, placing that among the clutter of NGOs uh, that we, or any other service providers. For example, you would have, you know, corporate service providers also. For example, in agriculture training, you have a lot of large corporates also coming in to provide farmers training. But we understand, our experience is, given our work there, we have, uh, you know, unlocked the IP, so to say. So there is something for us to offer. But how do you break through that clutter? Sure. So if it was so, linked to outcome, we could be better placed. That's how I would uh, take it. So we will come back to the measurement of outcomes and how challenging it is to actually measure some of the outcomes that are being delivered today sure. by a lot of service providers. But before that, uh, uh, can we hear Gul speak about what uh, Educate Girls does? So um, thanks, Atreya. Thanks to um, IntelliCap for organizing this. I'll give you a perspective that I have as a board member of Educate Girls. I'll first give you a little bit of background as to um, you know, what the organization does and a little bit of a flavor as to why I'm associated with them. We should also give you an idea of why we have embarked on this journey. So I think that everyone is aligned with um, Millennium Development Goals, Universal Education. Within India, you have RTE. And there are also specifically benefits to girls' education, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Now, Educate Girls approaches this large problem with a very innovative solution. It's not about creating friction or about working in an isolated way. It's about seeing how the largest scale opportunity can be tackled. And this comes through a confluence of um, working as a service provider uh, with local government schools and also local communities. So Educate Girls focuses on outcomes and those outcomes are very, very simply enrollment, uh, retention, and learning. The two most measurable being the first and the third, so the enrollment and the learning. And um, you know, Educate Girls has so far brought 60,000 girls back into the classroom, 
and because those classrooms are not single gender, they've ended up improving learning outcomes and benefiting 200,000 students. You know, so it's something which really caught my attention. You know, the organization is run with a great deal of energy, passion, and um, professionalism. You know, and, uh, and I felt quite um, uh, drawn to, to that kind of uh, energy, and I joined the board back in 2011. What we have is a, a situation where there has been um, a global uh, move away, I think, from uh, primary education, people being a little bit more attracted by vo vocational or later educational uh, uh, interventions. And uh, also you see some of the um, DFIs who previously looked at India maybe shifting focus, you know, like DFID looking at Africa. And Educate Girls has sourced its funding from a largely blue chip um, international donor base. And uh, these are really a, a community who understands impact and who really seeks an alignment with outcomes. We see a general reticence for that group or that wider universe to look at um, uh, sending funds to India, generally because there has been a broad uh, taint over the last few years in terms of uh, transparency and accountability. And you know, what better way to address that than an organization to stand up and say, look, I do something that I feel is, is being measured right now. There's um, something that I can share with you in terms of the impact that your dollar will have. And there's a global trend to accountability and transparency, as I said. So, so this is really what has a, broad, a lot of broad support at the board level for Educate Girls to pursue the um, impact bond. And you know, we've talked about social impact bonds. The one qualification is that where the counterparty is not a municipal authority or government, then we've tended to refer, refer to these as development impact bonds. You know, ultimately, you know, as uh, development occurs, it would seem um, desirable for the counterparty to switch from being uh, a development agency to being a government. So ultimately, I think everyone would like to move to the marginally simpler structure of a social impact bond. Um, so this is something, as I said, that has uh, attracted broad support from the board. You know, we're, we're very um, aware of the complexity of this structure, but we also have been an organization who's always been focused on big change and on impact in its truest sense. And you know, I think as a group, we're very clear that that isn't going to be developed to its truest potential unless you seek out innovation. Innovation in the way you deliver a program and innovation in the way that you fund it. And that really is why you know, I was very happy to come and, and give our perspective on this panel. So Educate Girls is, is on a journey. You know, it's, a, it's a long and complex one, but I believe that um, you know, it has a lot of potential to demonstrate that education, girls' education, and the way that its program is structured is, is a good candidate for this kind of financial instrument. Thanks. Thanks, Gul. Uh, what I hear is, uh, I mean, from, from two people, two different models, one looking at livelihoods, one looking at educating girls and bringing them into the fold. Uh, clearly measurable outcomes. Yeah. And that's, that's been a challenge, of course, in, in various sectors, but uh, in this case, clearly measurable outcomes. Now, uh, we have had the government actually funding various kinds of programs over the years, and uh, Dr. Pastore, you have even mentioned that uh, we have actually, through the NREGS program, almost 30,000 crores is flowing into the system. But we have no track of what outcomes it is actually producing. Now, uh, could you actually throw some light on how the government could be looking at an innovation like this and the willingness to actually participate in such a structure and the challenges that you have actually seen in the implementation of several programs on the ground? Gayatri, if we see uh, last uh, 65 years and even pre-independent period, civil society organization, NGOs and social organization are part of uh, partners development with the government. Uh, right now around 25 departments have provision to give projects to uh, NGOs and civil society organization, organizations. But the biggest challenge uh, 
when uh, government or any department want to give project, the procurement. Because government do not have separate procurement rules, mm -hmm. how to select, because it is a service, it is a knowledge, it is a expertise, it is not something goods or some thing you can procure. And we have only one law uh, that is called uh, uh, Bhandar Kraniyam, uh, stock purchase rules. So uh, now government of India is trying to uh, develop the procurement policy because government is the highest procurer. We have uh, in government procure, I think, around 30% of our GDP. It is a huge amount which is come in procurement. So procurement is the big issue because in India, uh, according to Priya, uh, they have data about the NGO. Uh, around 2 million NGOs are registered. So <laughs> there are and number as Anis has mentioned. So choosing the right kind of institution from that list is very difficult thing. Second thing, in government, we never try to develop parameters, particularly to measure impacts. Always focus on physical and financial kind of uh, measurement. So how much of money you are going to spend and how many people you are going to benefit is the only issue. In rural, uh, rural development sector, IRDP is the biggest uh, uh, world uh, program for self-employment we have run in this country. And now NREGS is another, I think, uh, the program only which is run in this country. Uh, I have never heard in other country they have this kind of program. The NREG budget is 30,000 crore per year and it is a demand-driven scheme. 100 days assured employment. But uh, uh, the biggest challenge uh, uh, is the how to measure the impact. So uh, government uh, is very receptive for new ideas. And uh, if you see the pattern, many schemes or projects which have started through civil society organization, uh, those who have shown successful, and later on, government have adopted those, uh, whether it is a right to education, NREGS, or IRDP, or the uh, SSG movement and microfinance. These are the examples which we uh, government have taken and then they come in mainstream. So uh, what a social impact bond can uh, bring uh, in the change to, I think three things, money is not Big thing, although money is the big thing, but uh, 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 raising the fund is not big thing for government because as Anis has mentioned, this expenditure is going on in the upper side. When uh, any uh, good organization will come through uh, social impact bond, definitely he bring the expertise, the technical team and uh, system how to uh, run the project. Second thing, uh, the measurement uh, uh, metrics, so uh, impact should be measured. And uh, third thing, government will definitely get new ideas because innovation in government have very limited scope. Although there are fund for innovations and many government officers are innovating and they are also doing very good thing and they have developed many schemes which have also adopted by the government. But uh, uh, to address the issue particularly in rural development, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, rural area not only uh, looking for money, uh, now 32% uh, GDP comes from rural India and rural market is uh, as far as big that South Korea or Canada. It is a growing market and particularly the household income is also growing, particularly in middle class. In rural area it is growing around 12% per annum and in urban area it is 13%. So social impact bond can give a new perspective to implement uh, the government schemes and uh, this partnership definitely uh, create a new ideas, new model for development. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Pastore. 
so what I hear is traditionally the government has been funding inputs and outputs. So you construct schools, you count the number of schools that you have constructed, a lot of capital goes in, but not necessarily the learning outcomes. Similarly in other sectors. But uh, uh, that you are very, very open to new innovation, innovation in financing as well, and that you will like outcomes to be measured and evaluated. And if there is a structure which can be proposed, uh, which is innovative, which can ensure that outcomes are achieved, the government will be fairly open to looking at such a structure for funding. So that's very interesting to hear, and uh, we will come back to your views. But uh, uh, can we have uh, your views, Simon, on how uh, you look at some of these programs and uh, developmental outcomes being achieved? and the success of these programs and how willing an investor like you uh, will be to put up that upfront cost and put in the upfront capital. Sure. So first of all, thanks Atreya for putting this together and I realize that we're a bit of a motley crew of folks here on the panel. You've got you know, education uh, providers, you've got government and you've got a, a corporate foundation. Um, so just very briefly, we are um, the corporate charitable arm of Shell um, and we back enterprise-based solutions to development challenges. Those solutions tend to be disruptive innovators in the form of for-profit enterprises, and they tend to be first movers. So what we have to bring to the table is um, beyond experience and skills is we've got highly um, risk-tolerant capital, typically in the form of grant, to get the first mover in a particular category off the ground. We've got to focus on energy and, and sustainable mobility. And I think the answer from our view is that the answer to that question on the, on the screen is, is definitely yes. Um, but I just, we haven't issued a bond as, a, as an organization. I'm not a development bond expert. I think what I'm here, the reason I'm on this panel is just to offer some observations um, from a player who I think has an appetite and an active interest to fund or to help fund the first impact bond in India. And uh, the, the, first, the first observation I've had is that the, the, the discussion tends to be focused in terms of service providers on non-profits. Uh, these are the, the examples that we've seen in the UK, they're the examples that we've seen uh, in the US uh, recently, but I think in, in our view, the model of an uh, impact bond can be as equally applied to for-profits as it can to non-for-profits. So second observation is that when I think about the energy sector and for-profit solutions in that sector, we tend to see a lot of uh, projects or businesses that generate very steady returns and a lot of social impact, but with a small uh, financial return. So we're talking sort of slow single digits. And in our view, unless you're providing, particularly in India, sort of at least into your double digit and probably your mid double digit returns, there's no way you're gonna be able to bring in serious capital uh, to support those organizations. You're always gonna end up with little pieces here and there from foundations and impact investors. If we really wanna bring in serious capital, we've gotta provide a way of offering that, that, um, that gap between whatever it is, three, four percent net to 15, 16 percent. Um, and we've got active players who can, who can, who can do that. So uh, second observation. Third observation is that we're actually, by introducing impact bonds, introducing more intermediation in the sector. In fact, I think we're offering, or what we're proposing is actually to offer at least two new layers of intermediation. Generally, to, to build efficiencies in markets, we think you want to reduce the level of intermediation. What we're actually saying is you've got to add a bond structure and a bond issuer, and you've got to add a government or, a, or a somebody who's prepared to buy the service. You've got to provide probably multiple service providers and then when you think about the investors, and this is the other reason I'm on this panel, is that when we think about who, who would actually invest in a bond, we keep talking about bond investors, who, who would actually provide that capital? And in our view, unless, it, well, I'll say this, it's very likely in our view that the, the, the folks providing the capital to that bond would need to be, it would need to be a tiered structure. It's unlikely we're gonna be able to find enough capital for somebody to come in and invest in the bond and bear all the risk of non-performance. You're probably gonna need a layer of first loss or equity layer, you're probably even gonna need a layer of mezzanine finance. You might even need a third layer before you get to the senior tranche of capital. So you're gonna need multiple different kinds of capital from grant, maybe some debt, probably some equity um, to get this off the ground. So this is not going to be an easy process. And in fact, what we've gotta do, what we're basically saying now is we're gonna need more actors to cooperate. But in our view, the benefit is so huge because there are so many 
opportunities out there that are relevant to this kind of structure and that we as an industry we haven't yet found a way to bring in capital at scale to fund that kind of organization this is in our view probably worth the effort and worth the additional complication even though this is not going to be easy so um, um, I guess th this is simply a call for other like-minded folks who can provide capital at the at our stage, sort of at the first loss or equity stage. It's a call for folks that are interested in coming in maybe in that second layer or the third layer. And it's a call for, um, um, for tangible examples from entrepreneurs or service providers, which is what we have here now, but there's probably more in the audience where I think in order to structure a bond, we're gonna need probably 10, 20 examples of who would actually deliver that service, how long would it take, and what would the cost be before we'd probably be able to build enough confidence with the investor base to actually invest in the bond and probably structure it correctly. So um, I'll stop there, but I think that's the, uh, just a few observations as, as a, I would say, an active ob observer. Sure. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I think clearly the same concept can be applied in the social enterprise and the impact investing space as well. In fact, we've already seen extensions of the impact bond uh, being, uh, I mean, at least uh, being designed at this point in time to figure out if uh, if you can have two different parties providing the return to an impact investor today who is participating in the market Indian market and we have had we have, I mean we have had conversations where models are being discussed where the business can actually provide the and where you have uh, the financial outcomes where the uh, social or the developmental outcomes being translated into a financial number and then being delivered by the government to the impact investor itself, or even to the mainstream investor. So I think what this structure does very clearly is to, if not converge the second and the third bottom line that, that we used to talk about in the multiple bottom line structure into a financial return, what it at least does is to attribute value and attribute financial value to those developmental outcomes. And uh, it, it's quite possible that we have a financial investor take up the financial return being generated by the business and the developmental outcomes translated into a financial return being delivered by the, by the government or another donor agency to the impact investor. So uh, that's fantastic. Second, uh, it's, it's quite clear that there's going to be a very huge cost to developing the first few impact bonds. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's added a, a couple of layers of intermediation. I mean, we have an intermediary which is required to actually put together the entire structure to translate the developmental outcomes into something which is measurable and something which can be translated into value. And it also requires another party, which is the government, to act, which can come in as the outcomes funder. So very clearly this has increased cost. This also means a significant amount of time. Uh, but we tend to believe that uh, the, once the ecosystem is built, once the first few bonds have been issued, the eventual costs of issuing a, such a bond will, will come down. Sure. And uh, uh, fantastic observation on the investor side where you have tiered investors come in. I think we are already discussing that. Uh, Simon, you want to add something? Just, just one last observation, sorry, is that we, we tend, just as a sector, and this is relevant to Suncalp, is that we tend as a sector to talk about impact and impact measurement and impact metrics and what is the framework to measure impact. And there's endless discussion around that. And in our view, it doesn't matter unless you actually can measure it, but also value it. And this is the first time we see a financial instrument that is being proposed where we're forcing the industry to actually value the social impact being created. In fact, we can put a very clear number on it for a number of different sectors. That's another reason why it's, it's so interesting. And maybe final observation is that we probably need a more exciting slide deck to explain how a impact bond works. So if anybody in the room, maybe we're looking at our friends at, the, uh, at Social Impact, if, if there's some fancy slide deck out there that shows how an uh, impact bond works that is uh, more exciting than, than a bunch of bullet points, um, <laughs> we, uh, we would welcome that. Sure. No, thanks. Uh, but, but I think that, that raises the, uh, I think, very evident question of of whether there are outcomes that can be measured. And I mean, we, we have a potential investor, we have the government which is willing to look at outcomes here. Uh, so I want, again, I think start with you, Simon, to, to look at potential areas uh, which you think do have measurable outcomes. And maybe to start with, if 
if you're looking at your own organization, what kind of areas would you be willing to fund? And uh, we'll come back to Dr. Pastore again to figure out what kind of areas, what projects does he think the government will be able to fund? Sure, so just quickly, we would be interested in backing um, energy and infrastructure plays, which probably means we would, we would, as an investor, want to see a bond that has an outcome linked to probably the amount or the number of kilowatt hours provided to low-income communities in India. When I say that already, you, you get a sense of, we can quickly, this quickly becomes very complex. How, how many kilowatt hours? Is it only low-income communities? What kind of energy? For how long? Um, so it, it, it's... It's going to be fun to structure that. Uh, you see, when you want to develop bond, there are seven stakeholders you have to bring on the same platform. So it is a little bit complex uh, process, and particularly the define the outcome is also a difficult thing. It is not so easy to define the outcomes. It is a very debatable issue and. Uh, Particularly in my view, uh, to start this bond in India, uh, there is a two, three clear cut area. One is livelihood. Livelihood through self-employment or base employment. Uh, second thing uh, is uh, the agriculture sector because we have a large number of small and marginal farmers. Uh, uh, around 78% farmers are small marginal and they have very little produce. So if you want to cut intermediary and reduce the supply chain at the both end, then producer company model will be the uh, model to implement uh, and give the quick result uh, for these uh, bonds. So Anish, uh, I would probably want you to talk about, uh, I mean, how you think about the work that your organization does in terms of outcomes. And uh, we have talked about the ability to measure outcomes, et cetera. And we do know that it's a, it's a huge challenge to actually carry out and execute that work and come out with metrics that can actually measure. But uh, I mean, you're here, there is a potential investor, there is a government stakeholder. And if you were to talk about some of the outcomes that your organization actually produces, then what would those be? Yeah, before I get on to that, there is a very old, you know, axiom in the development sector is uh, what matters is not counted and what is counted does not matter. So having said that, so getting uh, all these different stakeholders, you know, if you get an investor who is interested in outcome defined from his vantage position, then there is uh, government. From their vantage position, they will uh, try to look at the outcome. For example, as an organization, when I say, we are known as India's premier livelihood promoting organization. But internally, we are always saddened when we are known like that. If we were known as someone who, an organization which is able to seed dreams on a very large scale and is able to capitalize people to live those dreams, so we would be very happy. And that's what, for example, when I was working in the villages, that's what I was doing. You know, you're just sowing new dreams. With people who have, uh, over these thousands of years of uh, subjugation, exclusion, isolation, have lost the capacity to dream and uh, definitely live those dreams. But how do you measure that? So it becomes a real challenge. So having said that, you know, in a concrete context, I was discussing with uh, Dr. Pastor, let's take the example of a program like MGNRGS. What would the government be interested in? There is an annual outgo, there is a challenge on the FISC. So they would be happy. So in five years, the government is committed to provide close to about 75,000 rupees to each job seeker, each job, job card holder under MG and RGS. So if someone was to come to them, and that's what I propose to him, if someone would say to you that, in 40,000 rupees, we'll create a mechanism by which the job card holder does not come and seek work from you. So they save 35,000 rupees over a five-year period. So I guess they would be happy with that because that is one outcome that they are looking at is this fellow, which is a self energy is a self-selecting wage-seeking program. The person has to work in and demand wages. So if the fellow does not come in, their uh, you know 
outlay is reduced, they would be happy about that. And is it possible to do that? So in our experience, with say about 30,000 odd rupees, you know, we can create uh, durable uh, livelihood outcomes, which would uh, make it redundant for the family to keep lining up for a 100 or 140 day uh, per day job work. She will not be interested in doing something like that because she has got now better uh, returns from whatever activity she is pursuing. So this kind of arrangement we discussed with them. I thought he was interested about uh, something like that. And I guess if we get 30,000 rupees, and in a, say, there would be dropouts on the way, but so for 80% of the families that we work with, we are able to ensure something like that. In uh, three years, we are able to show a clear irreversible uh, trend towards uh, drop in uh, job seeking. And the job seeking is also related to other outcomes on the household assets, household uh, you know, incomes, we, which we can measure through uh, you know, verifiable ways and uh, less controversial means we can have to measure all that. So if you had to configure something like that, and there was an investor you know, who would say that, I'll uh, give you this 30,000 rupees, and from the government it goes and asks, uh, well, you are saving this much. Give, give me, you know, say 60,000 rupees if I get you to save uh, 15,000, 20,000 rupees uh, for this uh, job card holder. Will it work like a, for all the three parties, the investor, the government, and the service provider? So it did look like it will work. So the, we can configure like that for various programs from the specifics. So the outcome we can, you know, really reduce down to something like that. Reduction in wage seeking. So if you reduce like that, it will be easier to come on a uh, same platform because it is really very objective. The fellow has to sign up, has, has to line up to seek wage. But if you get into other outcomes, you know, of this variety, whether the self-efficacy has been enhanced or not, the agency has been enhanced or not, what one has done with that, uh, we'll get into a terrain which is best left to very sophisticated uh, economists to work over uh, long runs. That's how I will uh, take it. Even though it is very important, as I said, you know, my excitement for my work would be whether people are able to stand on their own feet or not. But how do I measure that? I know it intuitively when I engage there whether I am on track or not, whether I am succeeding or not. But to put it into a metric for someone like Simon to understand or someone like Dr. Pastor to understand would be hugely problematic. So I'll not venture into that. Great. So actually, that, that throws up a very interesting question. So clearly, I think, You've been able to articulate how outcomes can be, uh, simplified. be measured, simplified. Proxies can be used to come up with metrics that can easily be understood by, by investors, whether they are outcome funders or upfront sure. investors. But one of the allegations or rather concerns that uh, some people have raised with respect to the impact bond is that it's going to push the service providers over a period of time to engage in activities that almost necessarily produce outcomes, because those are the activities that will actually be able to raise funding. And it will push service providers away from activities that are less measurable or more challenging to measure uh, for various reasons. And you have highlighted a few of them. Maybe women empowerment. I mean, how do you actually measure that and uh, put a metric to it? So do you see that uh, the intermediaries and the financial markets are going to develop and mature uh, over a period of time to be able to come up with these metrics and very innovative metrics that can actually put a number to some of these because very clearly the developmental outcomes seven years back, five years back, there was no way we could actually put a number to it. And today we're talking about putting numbers to it. So do you see that evolving or do you see the service providers having a mission drift over a period of time? Gul, can you, yeah. So let me, let me answer that, and then let me, um, I think, open up another issue. So, you know, I've heard this, uh, this point repeatedly, and it would, it would be something which, um, you know, which resonated with me if this was the only source of funding, or if all funding had to come in one structure. Now, this is something that we as an organization are looking at incrementally. And so I don't buy the argument that with the... Um, uh, you know, the, the rise of uh, structures like impact bonds then other many worthy causes which don't lend themselves to impact measurement will not get funded. That's not going to happen. Come and look how many years we've gone with social impact bonds and look at the small drop in the ocean that they've contributed. So I don't buy that for a second. 
the, the point is, if you are an impact-focused organization, then, you know, great, well done. You picked the right cause or you've, you know, you've executed in the right way. You're eligible, so why not go ahead and, and, you know, work that kind of transparency and accountability angle? You've earned it, right? Now, the other point that I hear repeatedly is, oh, it's really complex. Look at the structure of a company, right? We have equity and we have debt holders. It's been um, present for time immemorial, right? No one is questioning the complexity there. Here you have people who are aligned towards impact. And instead of, you know, I, I think we've been on this kind of panel journey for over a year as Educate Girls. And I repeatedly hear these two points. And, you know, instead of getting into a mire around the complexity or the risk or whatever else, just get on, do it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll launch a panel on something else. You know, so from my perspective, I think that the sector needs to sift out those people who are at all interested in doing this, those that are, please go on a road show and meet those people who would like to match and be aligned with you. And you know, um, I think to Simon's point, it's actually much easier to attract um, investors than it is outcome payers. And let me just finish that point. The point there is that an outcome payer has traditionally been a government or in the, um, or in the context of a development impact bond, a development agency. And a lot of those providers of capital do not want to enter that role because they feel it will define their ability to switch to, um, to an investor role which generates a return later on down the line. So these are the kind of practical points of feedback that I've seen along this journey. I'm by, by no means an involved or in-depth expert here, but you know, I'm, I'm on the bus as far as uh, Educate Girls is concerned. And I would, I would be very happy with um, more uh, simplicity around this, a more focus on the alignment, uh, as I think it would benefit the instrument greatly to start thinking of it in a positive way, in the way that we're seeking positive impact. Thanks, thanks, Gul. I think uh, probably an appropriate uh, point for us to maybe open it out because you said, go get on with it and uh, just do it and not think and conceptualize. Uh, but but before that... Yeah. Don't uh, get paralyzed by thinking. <laughs> yeah. uh, you'd also mentioned that uh, the more challenging part is actually finding the outcomes funder and not the investor. And uh, that it's, it's quite hard for you to get the government involved in such a structure. Hmm. Firstly, it's a complex structure. And, and I would probably ask if Dr. Pastore wants to respond to that in any manner and then open it out for questions to the audience. Yeah, as I uh, told earlier, and uh, I'm really agree with both the gentlemen. He is on the bus and he's trying to get on the bus, and uh, he is the driver here. So, and you are the bus provider, <laughs> and so it is really uh, the thing. Uh, one more thing you see in uh, this uh, Company Act, 2013, the new Company Act. Around 6,000 companies have to invest under CSR, 2% two, two of CSR, and that rough estimate is 20,000 crore rupees annually. And uh, this is not the particular CSR uh, which they are doing uh, in previous years. It is a very structured and sophisticated, and government have issued the rules, and they have defined the area, and, and they have to mention in their books and publish in annual reports. So it is another scope to engage the industries and particularly civil society organization to leverage this fund uh, through social impact bond. And government is really looking forward and uh, uh, there are, uh, because uh, when you work, uh, uh, what is the difference between private sector and government sector? In private sector, they give you the target and you have to decide how to reach there, okay? Particularly when you work in the government, they give you the target and they decide the route also, in which route you have to go because there are auditors and they continuously audit you. So uh, that's why in government, there is little bit scope for new ideas and because once you lose the money, okay? Uh, whether it works or not works, then you have to become uh, accountable and you have to explain and now 
n number of people are asking from particularly in government government is uh, the receiving end in this time and everybody is blaming and asking the question through rti press politician every everybody so uh, really in my opinion if everybody come on the board and become the partner okay asking the question why not this is uh, doing and how you have doing and what is the result if everybody become the partner then they will understood ki what is the thing and how it is moving so social impact bond really a cre uh, creating level level field where all the stakeholders and all are comes together and work uh, particularly for betterment of the people the only thing it is the ecosystem and i think government is billing now to create the ecosystem thanks a lot dr pastori yeah you are absolutely right i think this is probably a unique uh, instrument which brings together the private sector the government and the donors and the philanthropists in some way to actually create developmental outcomes and uh, uh, with with this i would actually open it out to the audience and Hi, um, I'm Arti, and I work with Unis Social Business. Um, we are actually looking at designing a, a social impact bond type instrument for uh, revenue generating social enterprises. And I think, Atiya, that's one of the conversations you mentioned having. So my question really is for Simon. Um, we've been doing some feedback, trying to speak to a lot of people in the industry to see how this may be received. And one of the criticisms is that by um, supporting the sort of model you mentioned, which is a high impact, low return model, by creating an additional, say, revenue stream or some sort of uh, additional return element by uh, including an outcome pair, are you then inherent, are you supporting then a model which is inherently unsustainable in the long term, especially given the, you know, the dominant logic of the impact investing universe is that eventually these models must integrate into the market and be able to provide market returns. So, how do you respond to that? Sure. So I guess to compare, it's interesting. It's, it's a great question. And I don't <laughs> have a full, fully thought through answer. I, what, just a, one thing I would say is that what are we comparing it to? And essentially the, the question I'd have is what would be the, if we're talking about activities that create, uh, that are primarily designed to create public benefit, whether it's education or whether it's energy or, or some other service, what is the alternative cost? So if the government had to do it on its own, with its own money and with your taxpayer dollars in India. What is the efficiency and how subsidized is that? And I guess this is, there might still be a degree of subsidy here, but I guess what I would say is that we see this as a sustainable subsidy and one that is dramatically lower than what the alternative is, which is have the government pay for it or have private individuals donate, um, excuse me, donate money to, to do it, I, I think. But that's a half-baked partial answer to your question so I, I, I but it's the best I can do right now yeah uh, yeah actually my um, prima facie this impact impact bond looks like an you know uh, there are people with big money and there are people who need big money and there's just a relation the impact bond is just a relation between these two you know what about the small retail people if I want to just give 50,000 to an enterprise can I buy an impact bond because you know big companies like Reliance are built on small money from many shareholders you know ultimately initially they do go to big investors and get big money but eventually you know it's also the sh small people who want to contribute to that business or to that entity so it, you know if the impact bond is not going to ultimately be available to the retail or the individual in the society who wants to also put in say 10,000 rupees into a social enterprise and buy a bond um, you know ultimately it's just going to be an old wine in a new bottle you know it's going to be just like donation big donation going to Does anybody want to grab that? I, th I think I difficult to understand but I think I got your question which was um, how, how do small players take part in or how, how would a small business or a small service provider play a part in an impact bond? Is that right? There you go. Buy an impact bond for 
Can I as an individual buy an impact bond for say 50,000, I want to contribute to a social enterprise and you know, over a period of time that uh, you know, gives me some tax incentive or whatever. Uh, well, why not? I mean, the, the, the question isn't, I think the, hard, the, the harder question is how do you structure the, the, how do you define what the impact is? If, if you think about the strata of investors who could invest in a bond like that, there's no reason why if it was, say, a, a 20 crore bond or a 100 crore bond, there, there's no reason why 10 crores of that wouldn't be able to be participated by uh, ordinary I investors yeah. like us. Yeah. I, have I got the... Yeah, so, so if I understood the question uh, right, you're asking if an individual can actually issue an issue an impact bond, a social an impact, impact bond, bond you know, and raise... Buy. Can so, buy a social impact bond, okay. Yeah, instead of donating to an NGO, I just want to go and invest yeah, in a social but, enterprise or... Yeah, absolutely. Enterprise. I think technically it doesn't... In fact, one of the target segment is the individual. And uh, in fact, uh, the h &I segment or even other individuals can be a... A very attractive yeah, segment. Nice now, whether me. whether it should be the outcomes funder or the initial investor, again, that's that's something to be decided. But clearly, we have heard about alternatives to the outcomes funder also. So, can can there be other alternatives? But clearly, can there be alternatives to institutional investors who are putting in the upfront cost? And can it come from a pool of individuals? Of course, it can. Surely. Okay. Just, uh, Just on that point. In terms of the, the two ways that you could participate as a retail um, you know, investor in this bond, it wouldn't seem logical for me to, for you to participate as the outcome payer because you're already contributing through your you know, fiscal collections to the government and the government is naturally the one who takes that role. So that would seem a little bit uh, uh, disjointed to me. The other place where you could participate is as the investor. And there, you normally have one or several parties, according to who you, who you uh, speak to, who um, gets a financial return in a, uh, you know, in a binary way, if the impact is met or not. And that typically isn't the kind of um, investment that a retail investor would find very attractive. So it may be possible to structure, but given all of the effort, I don't know whether you'd have many takers for it. I'm Jacob from Industry Foundation, and we are, we are in the livelihoods, artisanal livelihoods uh, space. Uh, my question is that, or oh, uh, my comment in a question, is that uh, we're constantly facing this thing that it's going to be extremely complex uh, instruments, and it's going to, get, it's going to take time to figure out. Uh, what we do in the design industry is that we do what's called rapid prototyping, where we don't uh, put the complete product out in the market at one shot. But we put out elements, test them out quickly, fail forward in a sense. Um, I've been following with uh, Educate Girls for about a year on the progress of their uh, PBR, pay by results uh, program. And I'm sort of disappointed that there is no rapid prototyping of this being done. And I want your uh, comments on whether it can be done or not. So you know, this entire structure comes with a very heavy monitoring cost. And therefore, it's most optimal with large amounts, you know, from one to $10 million. And no one is going to dip the toe in the water with something which is that larger commitment. So I completely agree with what you have said. I think that the right approach is to do selected smaller bonds with parties who are interested in building the ecosystem and then be open source about sharing some of the insights so that future issuers can benefit. So I think that's a, the right approach. You know, I think, unfortunately, in this space, you're dealing with a lot of um, scrutiny, you're dealing with a lot of misinformation, and you're dealing with a lot of parties who um, are very um, obsessed with confidentiality. So it's very difficult to actually be um, you know, very informative about the journey that an organization like Educate Girls has, has gone on. A year ago, we would call it PBR. This year, we're calling it DIB. You know, so you can see that Educate Girls has, has taken this journey uh, to heart. And if, if you, you know, uh, spend some time within the organization, you'll see that the, um, the focus on impact is something which is in the, the blood of the organization. And that's something I'm really proud of. And also, um, you know, for something like a bond to work and to continue to deliver results at scale, you need to pursue innovation. You know, and there are 
program innovations that uh, you know have been developed and technology has been used in ways that I haven't seen used in, in other organizations. So, so I think that um, there needs to be a little bit of patience from the minority who are watching and waiting from this journey. So I urge you not to get disappointed, but uh, I completely agree with the kind of prototyping approach that you're taking, and that really is in line with the thinking that we have. I mean, additional comment on the, on the time taken, really, to issue a, I mean, bond. I mean, you've, you've been through the exercise yourself, and uh, an equity round typically takes anywhere from six months to even more than a year. And that's an industry which has been there for the last 30 years, maybe a little less here in India. And we wish that we could actually start prototyping, and in fact, we could bring down the, the time taken for an equity investment. And we have several people, in fact, in this forum itself who have taken far, far longer than that. Uh, and this is an innovative instrument which has come up only in the last three years with far more complexity and far more number of players or stakeholders in that structure. And we've just been talking about only between 15 to 20 such impact bonds which are under implementation today globally. And I would tend to think that anything uh, which is innovative for this to attain some sort of uh, an optimal time scale would take easily anywhere from five to ten years. And the first five years, we will definitely face a lot of challenges, and it, will, it is going to take a lot of time to find the right investors, to find the right stakeholders, the outcome funders, etc. So it's not going to be easy, and the costs of developing uh, the, the instrument are going to be quite high. And we do need uh, organizations which can actually fund the cost of development of, and fund the cost of innovation as well. Hi, good afternoon. Ravi Sinha here. And uh, no question is actually a clarification to a, as confused mind as I was before I came to this uh, session. Uh, one is a small clarification from Dr. Pastor on the CSR uh, stuff that you said. My understanding, and I could be very wrong, is that the bill as outlined now has very specific project-driven outcomes under s several sub-verticals. Uh, would this qualify? Because would it be a project? My, I, I'm not sure. So maybe that's a clarification which I want, which is away from the impact bond stuff. But more on the bond stuff, in, in the, if there is a scenario where there is a single outcome project, a single major outcome project, then I see it working. But unfortunately, in the space that we work in the development sector, there are actually multiple, several multiple outcomes which then lead to the final outcome. Am I going to measure the outcome as the final one? or? Am I going to get measured at all these levels? If I don't meet these levels, the final one doesn't happen. So are we talking of multiple impact bonds in a same project, or are we talking of one impact bond? If I, somewhere down the line, because of extraneous reasons, environmental reasons, anything, something happens in between, and I've done, let's say, four of those eight, and I've reached four well on the fifth, I stop, and I get delayed on to going forward, am I going to be the loser? Is the government going to be the loser? Is the investor going to be the loser? Where do we take this? Sure. So I'll let Dr. Pastore answer the first one. And uh... Uh, Under uh, Company Act, they have published rules. And the rules are available on the net. And uh, in those rules, uh, the uh, broad thing is, first you have to constitute a committee, advisory committee with board of directors, independent persons to advise the CSR. Second, they have defined the area. So now they have included more areas, more uh, subjects in that list. And uh, third thing, either you yourself do that uh, work or you can engage to anybody else. So when you want to engage anybody else, then uh, I think in my opinion, because the rules are just now published, so it is a debatable thing, that CSR money can come to the bond. 
because in bond you are engaging to some expert organization which is carry out that uh, work on behalf of you and since uh, in the bond arrangement it is a long term process say five years seven years eight years so it is a long term partnership with the all the stakeholders and uh, money will return from the government so that money can be multiplied okay again to the bonds because csr money you cannot distribute among your shareholders or somewhere else so a pool of fund can be created within the company and that pool of fund rotates several times to uh, do this thing so uh, of course uh, it, it's quite disappointing to hear that uh, that you stand as confused at the end of the session as as you were at the beginning but with respect to the structure where there are different milestones i don't think there is a standard answer to this i think every structure is going to be unique and that's the reason why it's going to take possibly even 18 months to 24 months to come up with a with a bond and and then those time cycles are going to reduce so we will require a uh, a few bonds to come out in the market uh, different sectors to be dealt with and different outcomes to be dealt with before we can actually say that i mean can we have interim milestones be integrated into the outcomes and into the metrics i'm sure they can be integrated the key is the outcome pair you see the outcome one can have a outcome chain as you have a result chain there are uh, you know intermediate results and then there is a final result so one can have something like that in uh, I mean, typically in any development program you will have that but here the key is which outcome the pair is willing to put his or her money on and that is the government so that's where it will become much simpler and much less confusing for example the government wants to put the money on say educational attainments of girl child acha so they can define it through some measure and this is what i'll pay on so whether that leads to 20 other things or not whether there are some intermediate milestones or not would become incidental so the result chain analogy would not work in this case because it is a specific outcome for which the pair is willing to pay and once that is decided then only the investors come in the picture they have to buy into that i mean they may not be convinced that they may say that this is like an intermediate outcome so they will not pay up. they will not invest in that so that's a call that they will individually take but the key starting point is the outcome pair and that's where this confusion will be much less and that's where we'll have to go to them to say which outcomes will be willing to pay and that's the starting point right so thanks thanks anish uh, while there are i think people waiting for questions we have to wrap the session up uh, there is uh, another session that is uh, scheduled right after this so we thank all the members all the panel participants and uh, i'll hand it over to him